Welcome to the Knife Life. The Chris is one of those knives that cannot help but capture the imagination of foreigners, and for good reason. The Chris is fascinating and it possesses far more depth than I could have ever imagined. It is a weapon with deadly intent, but is also the scion of both life and procreation. So how is it that a Chris can be both? Today, we dive into the world of Indonesia and the Chris. When I first started learning about the Chris, I didn't realize how far over my head I was getting. There is the Chris as Western civilization understands it, and then there is the Chris as understood by Indonesia. We're going to start with the more familiar Western understanding, and then progress to the Indonesian understanding. This is a Chris in its most well-known form. The shape that comes to mind when a Chris is mentioned is usually the wave of the serpentine blade. Surprisingly enough, that's not actually what makes a Chris. Chris knives with straight blades exist and are actually quite common. In fact, the oldest surviving Chris blades are straight, indicating that the undulating blade style evolved later on. A Chris blade is double-edged and it swells out from the back edge at the base of the blade. The blade itself is made out of two pieces, the blade proper and the ganja. The ganja slides over the tang of the blade proper and nestles in tight against the back of the blade. The ganja provides the widest part of the entire blade. A round stub protrudes from the blade proper to act as the tang for the knife, and an almost pistol grip shaped hilt is placed over it. Any blade that has these characteristics carries the name Chris. There are an overwhelming number of variations of this style of blade. The preferred style of blade changes from region to region throughout Indonesia. The Chris seen in Java or Bali is much more slim and petite than the one found in the Philippines, which is comparable to a European arming sword. As such, the use of the Chris varies according to the nature of the Chris itself. A constant feature among all Chris are the file marks along the swell of the back edge. These markings act as the maker's mark of the ampu or smith that forged the blade. A second identification of the blade can be found in an indentation on the blade where the ampu is said to have pushed his thumbprint into the steel. The larger blades, such as found in the Philippines, are much heavier and heartier weapons of war. Smaller crisp blades are meant for thrusting and making light nicking cuts. It is from these more delicate weapons that the Chris knife's reputation as a poison blade comes from. It is widely believed that there are higher levels of arsenic present in the steel of the blade and that a cut from an arsenic laden blade will kill or, at the very least, create slow healing wounds. It's not true. In reality, Chris blades contain no more arsenic than any other. A mixture of lemon sulfide and pulverized ore pigment, or arsenic trisulfide, is often used to etch the blade of the Chris and reveal its pamor, or Damascus pattern. However, arsenic trisulfide has a low solubility and has a limited toxicity until it ages with oxygen to create arsenic trioxide, unlikely to happen with a well-maintained Chris. What actually happens is that one of the warriors will take one of a variety of fast-acting poisons indigenous to the region and mix it into mineral oil. The oil is then poured directly into the sheath of the Chris so that the Chris is lubricated and receives a fresh dose of poison every time it is placed into its sheath. For this reason, it is best to exercise caution when touching the blade of an old Chris. Some of the combative techniques of fighting with the Chris emphasize only making small nicks when striking with the blade so as to let the poison do its work and allow the fighter to quickly move on to the next adversary. Straight-edged Chris knives are often referred to as an executioner's Chris. Chrising was a preferred method of execution where a narrow, straight blade was placed point down onto a piece of cotton resting on the condemned's neck by the collarbone. The blade would quickly be thrust down through the heart and removed, 
with the cotton wiping away the blood and keeping the whole affair neater than most other methods. A straight edge was preferred due to its slimmer profile, but not every straight edged Chris was made or used for such purposes. The popular serpentine blade had its own uses. The undulations of the blade act as macro serrations. They perform the same task as the smaller serrations seen in modern blades today. They cut more aggressively, tearing flesh, and they make caring for the resulting injury harder. The flame pattern also increases the cutting width of the blade without adding more material, increasing the mass of the blade. This is all achieved without the drawbacks of modern serrations. A serpentine blade is easier to sharpen and much less likely to get caught up in the clothing of its victim. The waves in these blades are called lux. A crisp blade should only have an odd number of lux in the blade. The number of lux is determined by counting the indentations in the waves of the blade. The blade should exhibit anywhere from 1 to 13 lux, with 5, 7, and 11 being the most common number of lux in a blade. Each number, 1 to 13, has its own symbolic meanings that can vary greatly with region, maker, etc. Another aspect of the blade that also holds a great deal of symbolism is the pomor. Most people are familiar with a pomor as Damascus. It's created by layering steel, iron, and nickel on top of each other and then forge welding the layers together. An almost unlimited number of patterns can be worked into the steel. Like the number of lux in a blade, the type of pomor bestows certain benefits upon the blade's bearer. The pomor sambarin gives profit. Often, pomor represents status in society. An individual would want to acquire a blade with a pomor for a station greater than the one that they hold in the hope that it will help elevate them. This can become even more complicated than the numerology of the lux due to the sheer number of pomor designs. One publication at the National Museum in Jakarta identifies 70 different categories of pomor designs. In reality, there is no limit to what a skilled smith is capable of creating in a pomor design. Often, a pomor's name can be determined by a fluent Indonesian who can simply look at a blade and state what it looks like. Often, pomor are made to look like the leaves or branches of trees and plants, but pomor are by no means required to follow this rule of thumb. What often draws the eye of many newcomers to the kris are the furnishings or clothes that are associated with the blade. By this, I mean the sheath, the grip, the ferrule rings, um, anything else like that. Chris knives usually have an almost pistol grip-like shape. The sheaths are pretty standard until they reach the swell of the blade near the ganja, where the sheath swells out pretty dramatically to match the shape of the blade. Various indigenous hardwoods, such as kamuning, trembolo, and sandalwood are commonly used in furbishing blades. More exotic materials, such as ivory, may be used. Gold, gems, and other highly valuable materials may be included in the garments of the blade. The clothes of the blade are meant to represent the owner. The swell at the entrance of the sheath may look like a boat, for example, representing an individual who lives by the coast or makes their living in a maritime profession. A wealthy merchant may have a chris inlaid intricately with gold. However, just like the clothes that we wear, the blade fittings can be changed out and replaced, and often are, to represent the blade's new bearer. Anyone looking to acquire a chris should remember that it is the blade that makes a chris, not its ornamentation. A very plain chris may be vastly superior to a gilded one. This brings us to the question of how a quality chris is made. What I discovered was very surprising and far more sophisticated than expected. The physical manufacture of a chris is not particularly different than that of many other blades but the creation of a chris is less forge work and more of an embodiment of Eastern philosophy. The closest analog to this that I'm currently aware of is that of the traditional Japanese smiths. By combining the elements of the earth, the creator, and humanity, the chris is brought into existence as an object of procreation and love, and we find the true Indonesian meaning of what a chris really is. But, that truth will have to wait until the next video.
If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing. I'd like to thank Steve Rollert of Keen Edge Knives for loaning me this superb specimen, as well as gurus Jacob and Daniel for sharing both their collections and their knowledge with me. For the martial artists among you, Steve makes the best aluminum trainers on the market, and I have used them countless times. Uh, I'll have a link to his site down below. For those of you interested in learning more about the martial system behind the Chris, check out the link to the United States Sports Salat Association. We will finish our exploration of the Chris in the next video and continue on to many other blades found around the world. For those of you interested in learning how to take care of that special blade of yours or wanting to just see how it's made, check out some of the other playlists on my channel directed at you. As always, stay safe and keep living the knife life.